This morning my message is titled, The Greatest of These is Love. We're going to look at the cross, and that's where we see the love of the Lord. There's a verse in the scripture, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 says, Now, abide of faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. The word charity is the same word. Copy and translated love. For God so loved the world. Same word. And charity, of course, is a, to me is a better word than love because that's doing something. <coughs> that's giving something. It's more than just saying I love you, it's proving it by action. And if, we're not going to read these chapters, but you can read them sometime. And Matthew 27 and Luke chapter 23, which deals with the, the Lord's uh, trial and crucifixion and uh, the things that he said on the cross of Calvary. And of course, everything about Christ on the cross is a manifestation of his love for you and me, for the world. As, he, as John 3 16 says, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's, a, that's something that we would just could wish the world could see and really hear it and understand it and believe it. Uh, well, we're going to look at the cross and we'll see, first of all, the sacrifice of love. I, I'm mindful of the, you know, the trial, the, the, actually before the trial in the upper room, the, or with his disciples and instituting the Lord's Supper and coming out, walking across to get to the Mount of Olives to the Gethsemane and praying the three different times that he prayed. Each time in the prayer, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Talking about dying for you and for me, willing to pay the cost of our sin. And then going through a mock trial, actually against their own laws, uh, to try him, to really wanting to kill him. And the next morning, you know, he had said before this, my hour has come. My Lord, it's time for me to, the hour that I've come to die for the sins of the world is here and I'm ready. And the next morning by what would be our time, about 9 a.m., they had him hanging on the cross at Calvary dying for you and for me. Uh, in Matthew 27, verse 39 through 42, that it's about the crowd, the crowd that was at the cross. Remember, he was hanging there on that old rugged cross. You know, we sing the song a moment ago, and I consider the forest, and I see the forest, and I consider the tree that reminds me of Calvary. <coughs> The Lord made all the trees and then he took one of the trees he made and, and hung him on it. Verse 139 says, And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, that thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. There's a mockery going on. The word said revile means to be abusive with language. I don't know what all they may have said, but profane means that they, they were just saying uh, terrible things to him, about him while he's hanging on the cross. But also it says that likewise in verse 46 and 42, rather, that also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the, and the elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. But you know, if he would have saved himself, then he could not save you. He would not be your, your and my savior. And they really did not understand what they were looking at. You know, the Bible very clearly states that. They would have known he was the Son of God, really known. They would not have crucified him, but they did. And uh, 
then went through all the things that they said to rail on him, but he was there for you. Greater love could not be displayed than, than him hanging on that old rugged cross for you and for me. And also we see, as he's there on that old cross, we see the prayer of love. And you know, all these people crucifying him, and uh, he's looking down at them. And the Bible says in verse 34 of Luke 23, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment uh, and cast lots. They gambled for his clothing. Uh, but imagine the love that he had. Looking at the very ones that had put him on that cross, looking at the ones that railing at him uh, and saying to his Father in heaven, they don't know what they're doing. Don't hold this against them. And I'm certain of one thing his prayer was answered that God did not hold that against them, that, or, or he uh, would not have even uttered a prayer like that. But, the truth of the matter is that they did not repent toward God and believe in Jesus Christ and believe he was the Christ. That it wouldn't make any difference. They're still going to be dying and going to hell. You know, when his enemies treated him completely as cruel as they could, he still prayed for them. And that's why he tells you and me, to pray for them that despite they use you, he tells us to pray for them, pray for those that are enemies, in other words. Don't hold it against them. They're not going to change it anyway. Uh, but you can pray for them. And pray for, for them to, if they do not know Jesus Christ, that they will come to know Him. But there couldn't be a greater love displayed than that on Calvary's cross when He's looking at these people that's nailing Him there and asking the Father, you know, to forgive them. I don't know what they're doing. Imagine the fact that uh, many times in a day, the different things that you and I, out of our own uh, ignorance, do things that he's saying, they don't know what they're doing. I've, I've already paid for what they're doing. Father, I overlook what they're doing because I've already paid for it. I, I, I imagine that of the many times, you know, it's like you with a little child. They, they don't know what they're doing. And you're trying your best to guide them away from harm. So it is with the Lord, with you and me. Gently, kindly, lovingly guiding us, directing our path. So as we continue to look at the cross, though, we see the answer of love. There's two dying, one on either side. And you know in verse 42 of Luke 23 it says, He said unto the one of them, said unto Jesus, Lord, you can't call him Lord unless you know he is. And I'm pointing this out because prayer doesn't say that the fact that he had already believed in his heart that Jesus was Lord, then he was asking something that could be requested, uh, that could be answered. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That goes completely against the grain of Catholicism, who says that there's a place where you go before you are released to go in heaven, a uh, holding place. No. According to this the very moment, he was dying on the, on the cross itself, right by the side of the Lord Jesus. And the Lord said, when he recognized and accepted him as Lord, he had to have accepted him as the Christ, the Son of God. And the Bible says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ was born of God, so he was already born. He said, just remember me today. Today when you go, I want to be remembered. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So the instant that a person dies, they're going right into the very presence of God if they're saved. 
that they're not they're going instantly into the place called Hades or hell the place is a holy place and we have a tormenting place until the final judgment and uh, the great and thrown into the lake, the lake of fire so we see that he answered with love that uh, today you'll be with me and today was that very day that Christ uh, about our 3 p.m. that he died that he gave up the spirit so we look at the cross we see all of the love of God and I'm there to you I'm not pointing out nearly all of it but what I'm saying to you this morning but we see the anguish also, well, in verse 46, Matthew 27, there was no place to place for the Lord Jesus. He, he was taking all of the hell of every human being in the world on himself. Suffering the most awful, terrible death a person can suffer. That cross was nothing in compared to the punishment that he was receiving from God for you and me. It wasn't that his hands is on the cross, his feet's on the cross. That's where he died. But he suffered yours and my hell inwardly. The pain and all that went with it. <coughs> Excuse me. In Matthew 27, 46, it says, in about the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As the soul of the Lord is torn by the inward sufferings and entering into the time of taking yours and my hell, being totally forsaken by God the Father, then we see these words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? <coughs> Excuse me, the word, these words are words that <clears throat> the cry of, of a person in hell. He's, he's paying it right there. That's the anguish of it all. The, the, the scripture shows that there was a period of time there were there was total darkness. And I'm sure it's never been that dark since there's been light given to this world. That he was paying the penalty of sin for all men that the Father in heaven looking at his son had to turn his back. He's of purer eyes than to look at him that, that sin and behold it in people. So he, he's dying all by himself. Nobody helped him. Nobody said holding his hand, encouraging him. He's dying by himself for you and for me. Paying the total price, the total cost of hell for every single human being in the world. And he offers himself as a savior to the world. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You, you can, I, I'm trading, I'm taking your punishment. I'll give you my righteousness. I'll make a trade with you. You come to me, I'll pay you your cost. I'll pay your price of hell. I'll give you my righteousness. You'll become a just person. You'll become mine. And it's offered. The Bible says it's offered unto all, but it's upon all them that believe. A great offer. <clears throat> we also see the thirst of love Remember the Lazarus, the rich man, gave him the sin, and that Lazarus just takes the tip of his tongue with water, just give him a little taste of water. And he said, I'm tormented in this place. Well, he was in hell. In John 19, 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things are now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. He thirsted. He thirsted in the soul of agony. But uh, that was the clear fact that you and I will never have to thirst 
we'll never have a trial. Send Lazarus. Well, he's taking care of that. And he took care of the, the full cost. And he said, I thirst. That's the last thing that was happening to him. And one of the very last. But also, we see the victory of love. And as he reaches the goal of the purpose to die for your sin and mine, to defeat the powers of Satan and uh, death, hell, and the grave, he cries, it is finished. Those are three of the most wonderful words you'll ever read in the Bible. That he had completely paid the cost for man's sin. And the word, it is finished, is three little words that mean paid in full. Not partially paid. That's what religious people get taught and religious preachers preach that you have to hang on to the end. He didn't pay it all. But my friend, he paid it in full. These words right here, they cried out. I paid it in full. I come, I come uh, for the very purpose of dying for the sins of the world. And he went through everything he went through. And when the hour came, he went to the cross. He laid out his life and died, paid the full price. And he said, now it's all paid. And so when a person comes to him, he, he doesn't have to keep on saying, well, I hope I'm saved. I may be always saved. I'm hanging on. I'm doing this. Salvation by grace through faith, that not of yourself. That not of yourself. It's a strike of the pride of man. It's a gift of God. Something that God gives to you the very moment that you accept His Son as your personal Savior. <clears throat> and then we see the committal of love in verse 46 of Luke 23. It says, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, He gave up the ghost. Christ dismisses his spirit into the hands of, the, of his Father. And the Bible says he had power to lay his life down, and he had power to take it up again. And so he had power to dismiss his spirit to his Father into the hands of his Father. Uh, now, he did this to offer eternal salvation to you and to me. In other words, the very moment you put your faith and trust in Him as your personal Savior, that very moment you become a child of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that we shall be as like Him. Now, the Bible says in 1 John 1, uh, verse 1, Now are we the sons of God. And it does not appear what we shall be like, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be as He is. Now are we the Son of God. The very moment that you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that very moment you become a child of God. You become one of His children. And you believe that He died for your sins and He paid your hell for you on that old rugged cross. This morning I'm encouraging you not to put it off. That's the easiest thing in the world to do, so I'm more convenient time. That's what Pilate did. I'll hear you at a, a, a more convenient time. Uh, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. <coughs> Maybe it'll be late tomorrow. You know, I was up there at the nursing home the other day. This is two weeks ago. This one lady there, she had, I knew she had, uh, uh, he takes the fluid in the heart, you know. Anyway, uh, she came by me and said, oh, they're picking at me. Next day, I didn't see her. I said something about her, and I said, she passed away. Just that quick. Today, you have this moment that you're not sure of tomorrow, and you're not sure of the next moment. That's why Paul said, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. This is the moment which your perfect faith and trust in Christ as your Savior, right where you are. Coming down here to the same.
coming down here is showing that you're not ashamed of it. You want people to know how to accept the Christ. I'm saved. I'm going to follow him for baptism. So if we all stand and ask the song later in us to come. We invite you to come. We encourage you to come. Page 248. Very first verse. You're in the place.